everybody. I'm Anita Finley, and this is Zoomer Times TV. Hello, everybody. We're, uh, we have another great author, and you're going to love it because it's from home. It's, it's our South Florida. And the name of the book is South Beach at War, Sun, Sand, and Soldiers During World War II. It was called Camp Miami Beach, the most beautiful boot camp in America. I'm going to show you the book. It's absolutely a book that if you were in the service at all, whether you were here in Miami Beach or not, you'll want to get the book. And I have Judith Burson Levinson, Dr. Levinson, who's actually here with us. And she's, um, she's the author. And of course, she's a Miami Beach girl. So welcome to our show this morning. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. And if everybody has their February issue, you will see we did a review of, of her book on the issue. Uh, so you'll want to read that also. But the most important thing is that we're going to actually have, we're going to have a, uh, a wonderful conversation about what it was like. Now tell me when you actually were down in Miami Beach at this time. You, it were, you were too no. young, so you weren't even I born. Wasn't, no, I wasn't born at that time. Um, my father got in a little trouble for, um, stuffing his bed and not uh, being where he was supposed to be. So he got booted back and he went around the country. He went to Gainesville and then he went to uh, Nevada and that, and then I was born in the Bronx after my mother came back from Nevada because her mother said, there are no good doctors down there. You need to be born. You need to have your child born in New York. So I was born in New York and my father got a three day leave. Uh, the war was not over yet. It was January 27th, 1945. So you know I'm 76 now, but right. anyway. <laughs> and I'm older than you, but I was born also in the Bronx, but I came down to Florida. I was here during, right after the war. So the most important thing about the book for me is that I lived of course in Miami Beach uh, most of my life and you had, pictures and talked about things that nobody knew they're gone now but you really are a treasury of information so um tell us the story of how you got all the pictures because that's quite interesting judy it is um well at the time i owned uh, my husband and i owned the edison hotel and i wanted to do research on if anybody famous had ever stayed in the hotel because i was born a yenta and i like to know these things so I started doing research at the main historical library in downtown Miami. And I found out that there was a group of World War II veterans who wanted to have a pre-millennium reunion. So it was 1999. And um, at that museum, I was able to purchase a lot of pictures from their archives. But then um, I offered to help them. They had nobody in Miami Beach to help them with this reunion. And I got involved with the Chamber of Commerce and um, I offered to host it. Um, I'm a former college administrator, mainly financial aid. And I said, what's the difference between running a conference for senior citizens and running a financial aid conference? Big deal, right? Well, the big deal was so successful that they wanted to come back every year. Huh. As a result, I was able to have shows for them, USO show, um, a memorabilia exhibit. And, um, and then I asked them for their own pictures that I could make copies of. I also had a keyword search on eBay, World War II Miami Beach, and anything that popped up, I would buy. And that's how I found out that in addition to the Army Air Corps, who were stationed in Miami Beach training there, there was a group of women uh, secretly breaking enemy codes at a hotel. And many of them went to their graves, not telling anybody what they had done because it was so classified. But I was bidding on a picture um, on eBay one night and somebody was bidding against me. And so I wrote her an email and I said, listen, I don't need the original. I can make a copy for my slideshow and uh, I'll pay you half of whatever it costs and I'll stop bidding. And that's how I got that picture right there because her mother was in the picture. 
At that point, and she was 85 right, years old. Judy. Uh, how old? And, um, so um, I had developed a booklet for the residents like you and for the soldiers who trained here to get their memories. And I asked them many questions. So she interviewed her mother over the phone to fill out the booklet. And she learned all of this about her mother that she never knew. It was really exciting. It was, and, and I just want everyone to know, I'm talking to Judith Ber uh, Berson Levinson, Dr. Levinson. This is her book. You can see it's South Beach at War and uh, Sun, Sand and Soldiers During World War II. And she calls it Camp Miami Beach. And I remember even before I met Judy and read, read her book, that my husband was in the Army Air Corps and this was exciting for him. He came down, he used to live in California, but then he, uh, he came here. And I think he always wanted to come back to Miami Beach. Yeah, thank goodness he, he flew B-17s and he did make it as about 25,000 so, um, Air Corps guys didn't. And so uh, he did wind up coming back here to visit and then eventually met me. And of course now he lived down here, but I want to go back to the stories. So what's happened now for you is this is the center for, for all the military, because you had other kind of military people who came here too. It wasn't just Army Air Corps. No, Miami Beach was just Army Air Corps, but on the Miami side, there was um, you know, the Coast Guard and different groups. Uh, but on Miami Beach, well, there was another group that would come back to um, Middle Beach around uh, Lincoln Road, and that those were um, army infantry guys who were right. injured overseas and they were part of a redistribution station where they were evaluated. Uh, they were, they, they got a fun guide to Miami beach. They didn't get orders. They got requests and they were invited to bring their wives with them. They got to go sailing and, you know, swimming but they were reevaluated to see whether they could be rehabilitated to go back into battle or go home. So that was another group that was here also, the redistribution station. And the one thing that people may not know, but you talked about it in your book about the submarines that right off the shore on, on the ocean, Miami Beach were German submarines. Yes. They were going up and down the whole state of Florida. But, you know, in the beginning, the, the citizens didn't like being bothered by all the soldiers. In fact, uh, they, they would be awakened in the morning when the soldiers would walk to their exercises. And they said, this is not nice. So somebody took a, an ad in the Miami News, the chief person organizing the, the, the soldiers, and said, you'd rather have our guys waking you up than the enemy. And then uh, one of the supply ships going over to Europe was torpedoed right off of Key Biscayne and everybody could see the flames and that became very real to them. So they all become, became very supportive of the soldiers and the war effort. And the women, um, <clears throat> they would bake cookies and hand it to the soldiers when they'd walk by, they'd march by, I should say. Um, and then there was a um, the USO shows and um, performers would come from all over the country to perform for them. Um, and uh, they had a, um, a, a big, what would you call it, a pier like you have in Atlantic City. Uh, it's not there anymore. And the women had this club there for the soldiers that they could play cards and they'd have food and they'd go to dances and it was all volunteer women they were they became very very supportive yeah and i can imagine a lot of them these were young attractive guys so i bet there were romances uh, you, you say that in some of the in some of your pages here yeah my chapter was sex in the city in miami oh. beach <laughs> But um, yeah, there were a lot of marriages. A lot of them came back, uh, settled here, like your husband did. Yeah. Um, they, they fell in love with Miami Beach. We have an expression when somebody visits here as a tourist that they get sand in their shoes. So the name of our reunions were sand in our boots. 
And um, <laughs> that's great. This was, uh, it was really, and they changed the whole complexion of Miami Beach by moving back here. There was a building boom in the 50s. Uh, the houses are still there now. Nobody expected them to last that long. They were <laughs> built quickly um, and they settled here. My father did not move here, but he vacationed here and he would bring us, you know, we stayed in a hotel on South Beach. Um, and they, <clears throat> at the time, the University of Miami was a little bitty school with, you know, like trailers for classrooms and taking um, advantage of the GI Bill, the guys came back and now it's one of our major universities in the country. Uh, but the GI Bill, you might recall, was the first financial aid program in this country, and they took advantage of it big time. Yes, my husband was under the GI Bill, but he was in Cal. He went back to California, and he went to Berkeley under the GI Bill. But uh, all the things you're talking about now, I only wish he passed away about three years ago. I wish he were here because it would have been so much fun. But I guess I heard some stories. But your book is uh, it is so precious. It is so precious, and I was thinking about the people uh, who now, you, who many of whom are no longer with us. But I would think that their families would love this to be able to see what happened because maybe they didn't tell them. Uh, you know that you're right about that because a lot of the, soul, the guys who came back, because it was mostly the guys then, uh, they did not want to talk about it. They did not want to talk about it because some of the things that they saw were so painful. Um, you know, my father did not go overseas, so his stories were more like jokes, you know, that they taught him how to be a medic and he used to give shots to oranges to practice on people <laughs> <laughs> before he would give a shot to a person's arm. And then, you know, things like that, but really, um, and he died so young, he was 46. so. Even when I moved to Florida, he did not know it. I didn't move till 74. Well, let me tell you, I think I mentioned it, but there are hotels that were there then and they are there now. And I told you that my aunt was uh, the manager of the Clevelander Hotel. And I did remember something. I spoke to one of my cousins about your book and she said that her father actually owned a bar during that time because, you know, that the guys were there and they could drink. And then um, I think I mentioned that my grandmother lived in the Blackstone Hotel for 25 years because that was a senior, a place for the seniors. When you were here, though, yeah, so it was there then. But what was it when it first was built? It wasn't for seniors. It was just a hotel, right? No, it was a hotel. Oh, yeah. And one of my, my guys who came to the reunions, he spent his honeymoon there with his wife. I see. And so he sent her a telegram and he said, I'm stationed in our honeymoon choice. So yes, not only was it a hotel, but at that time, uh, the beach was very segregated. Um, it was uh -huh. anti-Semitic and anti-Black. If a, a really? Black wanted to work in Miami Beach, they had to get a, a permission card and they had to be off the beach by five o'clock at night. Sammy Davis Jr., when he um, performed here, he couldn't sleep on Miami Beach. He was over in Overtown. But the lower part of Miami Beach, no Jews were allowed. So what's interesting about the Blackstone, it was built by Jews for Jews. And it's the tallest building because all of the hotels, like I own the Royal Hotel, which is right next to the Blackstone, and our hotel is two stories high. The Blackstone is 11 stories high. So it was really like, you know, up yours. What can I right. say? Um, but one of, my, one of my vets who we became very, very close and I interviewed him before he passed away, he um, was stationed in the Blackstone and they weren't allowed to use the elevator. So he had to run up 11 flights of stairs. Oh, had no kidding. Uh, but he had a girlfriend and the girlfriend's mother worked late on Lincoln Road. So he would go to visit her. He said, if it weren't for her, he said, I I'd still be a virgin. And so at a certain hour of the night, he had to be back so that he could be counted in. 
And so um, he would have to run back from Lincoln Road, which is and on 17th. And run up the hotel? And run up, yeah, but Lincoln Road's on 17th Street and the Blackstone right. is on 8th Street. So he had to run all the way and then run up the stairs. And that was the Blackstone. Now, that's a great story. Now, how would you have heard that story? Because of a picture? I mean, how did you get these stories, really? Something like that. Well, when the men came to um, the reunions, I made, you know, uh, documents of where they were billeted. That's what it meant, billeted in which hotels. Um, one guy was in four different hotels because he kept getting moved as, you know, people would leave. But uh, I was mostly interested in the people who stayed at the Edison Hotel uh, because that was my hotel. Sure. But um, so I know every hotel they stayed at and where they went and what their home address was. And they, as I said, they were so happy with the first reunion that they kept coming back. And I did it for about five years, five reunions for these guys. Um, yeah, most of them have passed away now. The last one to pass away was a Tuskegee Airman. He was my only black uh, soldier in the group. And he worked for the school board of uh, Dade County all his life. He was very healthy, drove around in a red convertible, played tennis every day. And he just passed away this last summer. But um, I, I tried to keep in touch with them all as best I could, but now it's too, it's very sad that they're all gone. Not all. Yeah, that's but quite most. a story. So, so that's what happened. So at these events, you kind of cornered them and got as much information. And as you said, you got whatever pictures you could from the, but I'll bet there are families now, hopefully that your book is out. There may be people who have pictures, didn't know that you existed and you'll get more things from them than you can talk to them. I know that's what you love to do. I do, I do. And people show up like this last year, um, I got an email from somebody that her father wanted to see Miami Beach one more time before he died. So oh. I, I jumped into action. I got him a room at the hotel where he was billeted. I got him meals and we had the mayor come and we did a special presentation to him and named the day for him. And um, he was just overwhelmed, overwhelmed. He was 93 years old. Absolutely fabulous. I uh, see now you're that takes someone with, with a lot of heart. And so this is not, I mean, this is a book, but it's really a life that you created here. So um, now your husband, this husband, he was not in the in the war at all, was he? Oh, he was in several wars, but they were all in Israel. Okay. Right. He was in the Yom Kippur War and the Six Day uh, War. Yeah. And well, you know, the one thing that um, that I was picking up on when you were talking is that um, South Beach is so different today. It went through quite an evolution. When I lived there, my grandmother, a lot of the elder ladies and men, they would sit on the porches. And then a wonderful organization, a group of people, and you know them, I'm sure, who changed and they went to the Art Deco and changed everything. And then it became international. Um, but there still are the apartments over there off 8th from 5th to about 10th or 11th. Old apartments that were there many years ago, weren't they? Yeah, with jealousy windows like they were. <laughs> right. No, my grandfather was one of them. His, uh, he lived in a, it, well, he lived in New York. But um, in the winter, he would come down and stay in this little apartment right behind what's now our police station on a, like 11th and Pennsylvania Avenue. So yeah, they came and they sat on the porches and they went to the beach and they had dances on uh, Lemus Park. Um, it was a very different, yeah. My, in fact, my grandfather said to me, I know I'm old, but once in a while, I'd like to see a baby. <laughs> <laughs> now Flamingo Park is still there. Was Flamingo Park yes. there at that time? Yep. Yes, they use that. They use that for graduation ceremonies when the guys would get their wings. Yes, it's still there, and it was there. Right, and all the main streets like Washington Avenue, Alton Road, all these things are in my life. And um, of course, you did say that, that you worked at the University of Miami for a while, so 
you certainly have become a Miamian, let's say. Yes, yes, since 74. <laughs> right, right. But I'm not yeah. a native. No. I'm not a native. But uh, yes, um, I, I, but you're right when you mentioned that this has become a passion for me. You know, I'm still collecting and I'm still finding out people who um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm on the Miami Beach Historical Association, so they know my email and I get emails. I just got a pack of memorabilia from somebody, um, a big pack, and it was quite fascinating of her relatives who have now long gone. She scanned everything before she sent it to me, and there's a picture of her relative in between Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz. It was fascinating. Oh, because of the USO, uh, all the events that they yeah. had there. Uh, yeah. Well, I guess my other question, though, about all this is how, if someone's watching this and they want to get in touch with you, would you tell us the easiest way for them to do that? Yeah, my email is jsberson at me.com. Okay, that's B E R S O N. Yeah, dot -E -E. com. Yeah, so it's very important. Right, and, and I hope you will buy the book because uh, it's a great gift to give to your family members, even if they are no longer, the men in the family are no longer here, their grandsons, their sons, I think they would love this. It's such, it's so nostalgic. Uh, and I think you did such a great job. And the way you say South Beach at War, I mean, the way you just titled this it uh, I, I had never seen anything like this before i met you judy and i have to say that the buildings look as good if not better than they did in the war thanks to historic preservation i served on that board for six years until i was term limited off but any renovation demolition any change had to come before our board so like one day I was sitting in the Edison Hotel office and someone came and asked to see the owner or the manager. And it was a guy who had been stationed in the Edison Hotel. He was visiting his son in Boca and his son said, why don't you go down and visit your old hotel? He says, ah, it won't even be there anymore. You know? So he says, no, the son said, no, because of historic preservation, you will see the hotel. He came and he had tears in his eyes just being oh. in the hotel. And he said that one time he was sick and he got in trouble and the sergeant made him clean the lobby with a toothbrush. <laughs> oh, and the floors at that time, they were very special. It's a kind of a tile. It was, I forget what they it was called terrazzo. It. Terrazzo. Terrazzo. Yeah. And a lot of the, you know, the owners would cover it up with something else, but then the if you're preserving it, you would uncover it and bring back the new, you know, the old terrazzo, which was in good condition. Some of it but, was beautiful. The, the design and all they, I don't know who were able, so smart that they could lay that, but it was, it was like tile, but terrazzo. Was yeah, it beautiful. looked like. And Easy this, to clean. Yeah, and this vet, the one who had been stationed in the um, Edison reminds me, um, he told me a story that there were alleys behind the hotels on Ocean Drive, you know, for taking out the trash and things like that. And so the guys would march in the alleys with broomsticks on their shoulder to practice marching. And their buddies would hang out the windows of the hotels and they would fill condoms with water and drop it oh, on their gosh. heads as they walked by. And, you know, some of the hotels were not turned over to the military if they didn't have in-room bathrooms. So there were still some tourists in the hotels, some hotels. So one told me a story about that the girls in the um, breakwater, because the Edison is in between the Clevelander and the breakwater, and the girls who were staying in the breakwater would, or well, one of them would moon the others, you know, from the rooms. So, you know, <laughs> You know, remember, these were 17, uh, 18, 19 year old guys right. away from home for the first time, many of them, and didn't know what awaited them overseas, whether they would survive right. the war. Of course. So of course. they were having a ball if they could. And their biggest treat was going in the ocean. The guy who 
um, the, the 93 year old who just came a year ago, he had never seen an ocean before. He was from Indiana. He had never seen it before. And he said that they used to take the bedding and fill it with air and use it for life rafts. <laughs> and they would go play in the ocean. Oh, see, these are stories. See now, just what you said, I never heard that. You, you really are a, you know, you're like a, a, a barrel of all this wonderful stuff. And I, I just can't, I, I'm so glad that you, you know, you and I hooked up and that you could write this book that, I, that we found and that we reviewed. I'll just tell everybody again, if you have the February issue, uh, you'll see the review in the February issue. I'll show you the cover of the February issue. A lot of people who get the Miami Herald won't get it until another week or so, but this is what the issue looks like. And if you go on, you go into it, you will see uh, Judy Burson Levinson's uh, uh, review. And it's just, um, you know, you, you wrote, you write so well. So it wasn't just that you were able to tell people about, you know, facts, but you have like, it was, it was fun to read it. And the pictures, I'll just show a few people, some of the pictures, you'd never see these pictures if you didn't no. see this book. I mean, they, they were just, I never saw all these pictures. I mean, it's just incredible. Where, where did these, where did the Air Force, where did the men get their meals? Where did they eat? Oh, that's a good question. There were some mess halls that were in restaurants, uh, like the Hoffman Cafeteria, which is now um, something else. But <clears throat> also the dining rooms at the lobbies of the hotels. And there were some temporary buildings built uh, that they would use as mess halls. And they would also take them out to the Everglades to practice jungle conditions. So they would live, really? they would eat outdoors. They would eat, they, yeah, they would have outdoor mess halls too. Really? Huh. Well, can you still see me because I have- Yes, I can see you. But okay. I'll tell you the, the toughest part about finishing this book, which took me 19 years to finish was you know, deciding what to keep in and what not to, because I couldn't just keep going and going and going. I had to finish it. So um, there's a lot more that of uh, pictures and stories that I have that just didn't make it. They didn't make the cut. <laughs> so Two are minutes. you working on a second book? I would think you might want no, to. No, I, no. This, what you have in your hand is the third edition. So it had some editions in it. But I no, see. I'm not working on a third book right now. Oh, so this is the third but I've been edition. But I've been asked to. <laughs> right. Well, I will, uh, and I also see golf courses, exercising on local golf courses. I mean, it's just amazing. And, and so famous stars, movie stars came down here to entertain the troops. And there were famous movie stars who were stationed here, like Clark Gable, Tony Curtis, The Music Man. Oh, really? Yeah, they were stationed here, yes. I saw you refer to Clark Gable. So sure, these people, just like Elvis Presley, of course, later years went into the service. So they were stationed here and uh, it must have made quite an impression on all yeah, these the girls would the girls would line up outside the hotel of Clark Gable waiting for him to come out. So they had to keep moving him to other hotels. <laughs> Amazing. So Dan, have we run out of time? Yes, we have. Oh, uh, okay. I guess we're going to say goodbye to, Ju to Judy. This is um, Judith Burson Levinson, Dr. Levinson, South Beach at War. And uh, we thank you very much for being on our show with us. And I know a lot of people who see this are just going to be with their mouths open like I, I was every time I got into your book. So just have to keep in touch with us and we'll, be, we'll see you um, with another Zoom interview next month. But thank you very much for, for sharing and doing everything you did for the military. It's just beautiful. I, my, my heart was pumping for that. I, I appreciate your kind words. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank okay, you, bye everybody. We'll be back with another Zoom interview. Just stay with us. Thank you.